Bob Jones is known to just about everybody in the county. He had a life, I guess, before he became the county agent, but he has a new life as the one of the prime moving forces uh, behind the saving of the Hoff Barn, one of the oldest structures, if not close to the oldest, in the county. So without further ado, here is Bob Jones. Thank you, Tame, and welcome. Uh, uh, I hope all of you have had a chance to vote uh, this morning or will vote right afternoon. And I'll try not to be run over my time uh, in uh, the program. There are two people that I want to mention today that have just been outstanding uh, in uh, some of the work of the barn. And one of them is Richard Blackston. And I want Richard to stand up. He is what I consider the log building expert. Uh, and uh, I asked him, yeah. I asked him initially to be on our, uh, to, uh, if he was interested in uh, moving the building. And he said, no, I think that's a little bit too big a project for me. And, uh, but I'll be willing to be on your committee. And that was music to my ears because uh, uh, he was the one that we all looked to, including the building contractor uh, for anything regarding the log, log issues. The other person is uh, here taking my picture for the uh, Carroll, Media, Carroll County Media Center. Nancy Hernandez has been a trooper uh, in filming the barn from the original location to the disassembly, the reassembly, and all the issues and things that went in between, and she came on a moment's notice many times. So Nancy, uh, let me thank you, and let's show our appreciation to her. Okay, the story of the Huff Log Barn. Um, it was built when George Washington was president. Uh, Marlon Huff was one of my 4-H members, a very successful dairyman, and he was dying of pancreatic cancer. About six months before uh, he did pass away, a furniture maker from the Bethesda, D.C. area, uh, stopped in and wanted to buy the barn. He offered him $40,000 for the barn to have the logs taken down so that he could make furniture out of it. Marlin didn't want to see that happen. He didn't want to see the old barn destroyed. And so he offered it to the, count, to the farm museum. And of course, the farm museum is owned by the county commissioners here in Carroll County. Uh, we went to the commissioners and uh, they approved of uh, moving the barn to the farm museum, provided it wouldn't cost them any money. And we said, we'll raise the funds. And some people might think that's odd that they wouldn't put any money into it, but I'm not so sure that isn't the spirit of Carroll County, where people are willing to come together and work on a project that they think is important and indeed they did. Um, we formed an advisory committee of 37 people um, and we met for the first time in October 2005. So this has been a five-year project. Little did I know that it was going to run over five years, but uh, it, it did. Uh, and so uh, I agreed uh, with uh, some of the others to chair the project. And we have a vice chairman uh, who is Melvin Vale Sr. I thought maybe Melvin would be here 
He was a classmate in New Windsor High School with uh, uh, Marlin and was at the time the chairman of the uh, Carroll County Farm Museum Board of Governors. Our sec uh, secretary is my wife, Charlene, and it's always good to have a secretary close to you when you need lots of guidance. Uh, and Caroline Babylon uh, is secretary, uh, is treasurer of the Ag Center. The Ag Center is a 501c3 organization, and so we organized our committee under the auspices of the Carroll County Ag Center as a subcommittee. And so we are do qualify as a 501c3 organization. We had five subcommittees. Uh, the technical committee was Dave Roush. Uh, as many of you know, Dave's one of the candidates for county commissioners. But he had retired from uh, the uh, Portland Cement Company and uh, Union Bridge, and he was responsible for moving the barn. Uh, and. Um, so he was in charge of all the contracts and that sort of thing. And as I already mentioned, uh, uh, Richard Blackston was our log expert. Uh, I told the contractor, I says, any question you have a law about logs, don't ask anybody but Richard Blackston. And we, all the rest of us, understood that. And indeed, I didn't try to answer any questions for him. Uh, we had a grants committee, that's Harry Conover at the time. He was the chairman of the Board of Governors after we organized the committee for the Farm Museum. Uh, Bob Shirley is chairman of the uh, educational committee. And um, Kathy Huff, this is Marlin's widow, was, she chaired the recognition committee. And then uh, the fundraising and the public relations committee, I chaired the fundraising committee. And along with uh, Ned Cuman, uh, who many of you know, uh, that assisted me in that endeavor. Um, the barn was built on a 131-acre farm that was inherited by Yost Greenwood. Yost Greenwood was the builder of the barn, and the Greenwood, uh, uh, a, a number of the Greenwood family uh, is buried in the little uh, brick uh, church on Greenwood Road. And the uh, Historical Society has an excellent pamphlet on the Greenwood family and uh, their relationships and the different activities that they were involved in. Yost was a farmer and a blacksmith. And a blacksmith was an excellent uh, support for anybody that had a farm or a farm operation at that time. Um, we've, uh, uh, oh, I do want to mention that the barn is about uh, 50 feet high from the stable level to the top of the roof. Uh, it uh, measures 50 feet wide and 37 feet deep. And uh, when we had a couple Amish uh, men uh, that were interested in perhaps participating in moving a barn here, uh, they walked in the little door, uh, in the barn door, and they looked up and they said, wow, this is a big barn. Uh, I don't do a very good uh, way of uh, expressing the Amish uh, speech, but uh, it was interesting to us how he said that. Uh, that's the organization that we worked under. And so without boring you any longer, I'm going to show slides. So if we can have the lights out, we'll be ready. This is Kathy. This is uh, Marlon's widow. And that's the sign that was... Uh, that has been erected at the uh, entrance to the barn. Uh, this is a newspaper account. Uh, Wednesday, June the 23rd, 2004. And that's Marlon uh, about six months before he passed away with cancer. And that's the barn in, in its original location. You can see 
Uh, on the uh, side of the barn, this is a lean-to uh, uh, that was fixed up for heifer uh, raising, and the stable had been gutted. Uh, this is Kathy there with the barn. Uh, picture that, 216 years old. Uh, and when they did the, ran the surveying instruments, instruments on the barn, it was six inches out of square. Inside the barn, you can understand uh, how excited it is to see something like that. I traveled by that barn uh, for uh, 27 years. I never knew that it was a log barn, just looked like an old barn to me. That's Kathy and Melvin Dale uh, looking at the barn, and you can see the date, January the 24th, 2006. Look at the craftsmanship. This is a style of notching the, the barn, uh, the, the logs, and uh, placing them. Uh, there are no uh, pins or nails in the logs. The, the barn was held together by these notches. And of course, what they did, they pulled against each other. Uh, and uh, I think the craftsmanship to see that is wonderful. To think that they notched the log on the ground and then hoisted it up in place and it fit. Not only did it fit, it fit that well. That's in one of the hay mows. This is the old stone foundation, 22 inches wide, 153 linear feet of stone foundation. No footings, no footings required because they knew how to build barns and that's one of the reasons for the wide foundation. That's the advisory committee, most of the advisory committee anyway, that helped with the barn. You see Julia, Julia Googe, <laughs> the chairman of the county commissioners acted as an ex officio member of the committee. Uh, and uh, it was wonderful to have the support of this advisory committee. That's the location of where we put the barn. We wanted to position the barn correctly because most barns, most bank barns were always into the bank on the north side of the barn so that the barn would gather the sun rays in the, in the winter time to keep the barn warm, and with it being sunk down into a bank, it also kept it somewhat cool in the summertime. And by the way, uh, Charlene has a picture and also a, um, uh, a sign up for if you'd like to be a, a guide, and I'll talk more about that later. She'll, she'll circulate that picture for you to see and also the sign up sheet. That's the dismantling process. Easy to dismantle. They dismantled it in about uh, four or five days. Uh, that log there is a 50-foot log. There are five 50-foot logs here that tied the pens together. Uh, that log, uh, by the way, all the logs but two were oak logs. That log weighs about two tons. There it is, being stacked, ready for movement to the farm museum. There's the bare bones. Uh, you can see down here in this area, that's, a, that's an open area. That was what we call loose housing for young stock uh, heifers uh, that uh, were raised there on the farm. And the logs ready to be moved to uh, the farm museum, and there's one load. And they were all numbered. And by the way, these are cattle tags. 
and you use different colors for each of the pens so that the logs could be put back exactly the way they came out. And there are the stack of logs and you can see the beginning of uh, the uh, uh, log work on top of the foundation. And you can see over here is where I took the picture that showed this location. Uh, and it, it is properly located. Uh, these are new logs. There were 33 of the 90 logs that had to be replaced. Uh, we didn't know that at the time, uh, but under the barn floor, the logs had decayed. They didn't show it down below, but they sure showed it when you took the floors up. But the floors had been, uh, been there for 216 years too. And this is the beginning of the stonework. Uh, somebody uh, would wonder, well, why does it take uh, $400,000 to move a barn? Uh, the contract for the stonework, that 153 linear feet was uh, $75,000. And so, uh, and it was amusing. Some people would say, well, I guess you moved the foundation altogether. I said, yeah, we did. We took, a, we took a, a front end loader, scooped up the stones, put them on a dump truck, they brought them over to the farm museum and dumped them. But you start from scratch. And Muller uh, uh, Masonry, uh, by the way, another 4-H youngster uh, and an outstanding mason uh, had the contract for building the barn. And there it goes up. The witness, some of these things had to be fabricated again because obviously some of them didn't last 216 years. And there's an example of the, of the stonework, but also this is the holes for the harness pegs. That's where you hang your harness uh, up uh, back of the horse, horse stalls. Bob, was that mortar between the stones? That what? Was it mortar between the stones? Well, the mortar all comes out when you <laughs> move the stones. Fortunately, the mortar was matched perfectly. It was kind of a yellowish uh, mortar uh, that uh, we were able to match. Uh, they, what he did was took some of the old ground, uh, old mortar, ground it up real fine to see what texture it was and also what the color was. And uh, they just did a magnificent job on that stonework. Uh, this is putting in the first girders. Uh, and those girders aren't just a long log. They were notched, and uh, it was a, what do you call it, pinion and, yeah. Mortise and tendon. Mortise and tendon. That's what I wanted. See, I need help. And there's that uh, center, the post, the support posts had already been done, and all this had to be new work. And uh, they tell me that in restoration of buildings, if you're going to do new work, you don't try to duplicate the old work. You try to duplicate the way it was done, but not with old lumber, old timbers. They didn't have one of the, these mechanisms to lift those logs that we were able to do. This is the uh, contractor, Glenn James, with Craft uh, Wright uh, Construction right here in Westminster, the firm is, and he's doing some of the uh, mortise work there. Uh, hand work, hard work, and very good work. 
Another example of what they did in tying the, particularly the rafter structure together. Here they used the, the pins to pin the, uh, the braces. And one of the logs that they hewed out, it, it would take about, uh, uh, for a good hewer, it would take about a day to hew a log. 90 logs, both sides. Can you imagine taking a horse and an ax out into the woods and starting with 90 logs, bringing them in, dragging them in, hewing them, notching them? Tough work. And there's the first pen. Some would call it the first mow, but it's technically called a pen. You see the, the overhang. This is called the forebay. And this is a stable area here, and you see how it fits so nicely into the bank. There's the two pens and the center entryway. That was the flailing floor where they flailed the wheat and rye and grain. There's the first 50 foot log up. Ties the whole thing together. Uh, there's three of the 50 foot logs on this side. And the interesting thing about this, you put a log here, you come over there and put a log to match that one, and then you go to the other side and put the log on the far side over there and come back and put the log here. Uh, a lot of people have said, well, what, how do you get two-ton logs up there? Well, one answer that I used to, somebody used to give me was they had sky hooks. Uh, and I know that some of you recognize that answer. Um, we asked about that, and they certainly used pulleys and ropes. But Glenn James said there were occasions that they would actually build the building around a tree or a couple trees. And then they were skilled with wood, handling wood anyway, and they simply cut the tree down little blocks at a time. And, uh, but that gave them their, their position that they could uh, uh, tie their, uh, hook their pulleys on and uh, use it to uh, pull the logs up. And there's the beginning of the rafter supports and you see that there are two supports of, of the rafter, that one there and then this one here. And this is called a queen style uh, construction as opposed to the king style uh, roof support system. Uh, and I mentioned before, it's a Schweitzer type style barn. And you see the, the hay area, both sides with the center entrance. This is at uh, dedication day. We set the dedication day seven months ahead of time. Unfortunately, we didn't talk to the weatherman, and I think in 2000, uh, when was it, 2009, yeah, that we, we were going to start reassembly, and uh, I think it rained about every second or third day in the spring, and uh, we had the dedication in July, and so we went ahead and dedicated it uh, in July. And actually, I'm kind of glad we did because everybody got to see the logs uh, in, uh, and how it was assembled. And so this was uh, July of 09, and uh, that's uh, Harry Conover, one of our committee members, Dave Rouse. I think he's also the chairman of the, the Historical Society. Is that correct? And then Ned Kuhlman 
uh, on the day of the um, dedication. Uh, uh, there's Bob Shirley, he's chairman of the education committee. Uh, Tracy, um, Tom Tracy, and Delegate Elliott. He was on our advisory committee, and this is Marlon Huff's son, uh, Matt Huff. Actually, technically, he's the one that gave the barn to the Farm Museum because Marlon had already died by the time the papers were signed, and he was the one that wanted to follow through on the donation of the barn. There's a, uh, we had a big crowd for the dedication, about 300 people there. And there's the contractor and his dad and his girlfriend uh, there with the, uh, uh, for the dedication. And that's part of the dedication ceremonies. And we had a surprise visitor. George Washington showed up and spoke to the crowd, which I thought was really re unique. Impersonated by uh, um, Dan Hartzler. I thought maybe he took him out of the grave. Uh, there's a four bay with the framing, see these rafters came all the way down. And that's the rafters with the purlins. The purlins are the ones that go uh, horizontally to hold on the uh, shingles. And the siding. And ready, about ready for the roofing. And there's the roofers. They did that in about four days. Uh, it's a, uh, it was a, an authentic uh, triple layer, hand split sh uh, cedar shingle that is on the barn. There's one of the shingles. Again, uh, On the back side, of the, on the front side of the barn now. The finished roof. You see this area here hasn't been closed in yet. Um, I'm particularly excited about this. The, the big barn doors don't have any hinges. Now those, those doors are about nine and a half feet wide there's two of them that fold out like this. And they're about, what, 12 uh, feet high without hinges. So how does it happen? This is the way it happened. And uh, they were uh, fabricated by uh, uh, Will Hyde, Scott Will Hyde up in Detour. He made his round uh, peg there and sunk, you sink the bottom into the floor board. And I'll show you how the top is done. But here he hasn't finished. This is mostly handwork, chiseling, sawing. Now you see the pegs where he started to put them together. There's the mortise work. Then laying them out on the floor, pin them together. And this doesn't show up, unfortunately, very well. Uh, oh. I'm not sure you can see that very well. Anyway, this is a half moon. And the top part of that pole uh, fits into there, and then you have a metal 
a metal uh, uh, holder that bolts on one side and then you put it over and, and it, molts, it uh, bolts on the other side and holds it in place. And there it is in place uh, at the top. You can see uh, with the metal band over it and the bottom part is inserted into the hole in the floor. And there's your door. And there are the two door structures together. Nancy was out there doing her filming. Um, there's the doors starting to be fabricated uh, with, the, uh, with the boards. And there's the closed in area above the doors. Uh, you can see here the, uh, where the uh, poles fit in. And what do you call this uh, area? Pent. P-E-N-T. -E okay, with the typical wooden uh, rain gutter. And the little door to enter into the barn floor. I didn't want to have to open those doors all the time, but surprisingly, they open very easily. Uh, a five-year-old could open the door. And one of the many volunteers that we have, that's uh, um, Real. Real. <laughs> Elwood. Elwood Real. You see, I really need help when it comes to remember names. Elwood Real did uh, the nail, put in the barn flooring on that side for the hay mow. And this is, this is what the stable area looked like with the uh, front posts already installed and the new stable parts. Wait a minute, there we are. Um, Schwarzbeck's uh, moved that in on their trailer. Uh, that's much of the heavy stuff and then Richard moved the rest of it in from a barn that was built in about 1840 on Uniontown Road and it had never been, uh, had never been tampered with. So it's authentic. There's fitting in the slats. There's that guy that we depend on so much. Uh, and there's Richard and his grandson. His grandson spent the summer here from Africa. His parents are missionaries in Africa. And Eric was here all summer and he just was a, he was a worker. And we're grateful to Eric and Grandpa for teaming up on so many occasions there. And they're, they're starting to put in the uh, cow stalls. And there's some of the cow stalls already installed. Um, that barn's awful dark uh, inside, and so a flash camera only does so much. Some of the, uh, the, the hay racks installed. And there's um, a, another guy that's uh, digging post holes and sometimes you hit lots of stone and rock. And so it's not easy work. And if you look at that shirt, it was about 92 degrees that day. And uh, that's Bill Fisher from out in, uh, towards Manchester that has been a great help. And there's the three of them positioning the post uh, to hold the box, the box stalls. Melvin uh, Bale on the right and Bill getting ready to uh, attach the doors. And Melvin and Richard, uh, I'll tell you, you don't just pick up the stuff and move it and put it in place. You redo it 
a lot of redoing. And that's what's going on here. And then um, as we finish the barn, uh, having paths that will be suitable for disabled uh, folks in uh, wheelchairs and so forth to get to both levels. And a row of uh, cypress trees uh, to uh, uh, give some division between the barn that's right beside it and this one because there's over a hundred years difference uh, between the two barns. And we think that that will uh, tend to take a person back into the proper time period. And the electrical service that was uh, put in by the Rodkey Electric. And yes, we will have electrical service in there because there's got to be some indirect lighting in lots of areas of the barn so that people will be able to see it. But we'll disguise the electrical lighting pretty well. Uh, this, is one, uh, this is our mannequin horse. By the way, Charlene, have you passed that picture around? Yeah, we'll go ahead and do it now because people. Uh, there's a mannequin sheep in the, sh in the box stall. And a mannequin calf. We're going to have live animals for fall harvest day. Uh, and that's our mannequin cow. Um, uh, the cattle that they kept were a dual purpose cattle. They wanted them for both milk and meat, and so they were not like our modern dairy cattle. Uh, this was a Red Devon. A Red Devon originated in Devon County, England. And there's the executive committee, and this is a committee that we put an awful lot of uh, dependence on, and they did an awful lot of work. Uh, there's Dottie Freeman, the, uh, the, the director of the Farm Museum, and my wife Charlene, myself, Kathy Huff, Caroline Babylon. Did I see Caroline come in? She's not here, I guess. Anyway, she's the treasurer. Bob Shirley, uh, Richard Blackston, Ned Kuman, Dave Roush, Harry Conover and Melvin Bale. Uh, the executive committee is composed of all the chairs of the subcommittees. We meet monthly, and I would say that we probably have had a 90% attendance over four years. Just a wonderful, cooperative bunch of people. Uh, we had two naming opportunities. One of them was the uh, stable, and one was the hayloft. And they, uh, R.D. Bauman and Sons, the Bauman boys, uh, donated this, and they named it the R.D. Bauman Stable after their grandfather. He was the originator of the R.D. Bauman uh, feed and fertilizer and farm supply business. And Buck Miller Hayloft, Buck did all the, all the uh, uh, excavation and the cleanup at the original site, the excavation here, uh, and uh, was always available to help in any problem that we might have run into. So we're deeply indebted to both the Baumans and the uh, uh, Buck Miller. Uh, Buck Miller was, it was all done in kind, and uh, that was a minimum a gift of $50,000. And it cost more than $50,000 to do the work that he had done, that he did. This is our recognition board uh, that we recognize uh, all the donors in excess of $500. Uh, and there are several levels there. Uh, a number of people in the room here have donated uh, cash, and 
Uh, we've had some people that have donated and then they raised their level of donation. And that's how we came about with a little over $400,000. Uh, this is uh, uh, a, what we would call a memory tree. Uh, it, uh, it's to commemorate or honor uh, or memorialize families or an individual. Uh, there are 30 leaves on here. It's going to, this is both of the recognition board and the memory tree board is going to be posted in the hayloft area of the barn in a very prominent place. There are 30 leaves on here. We've already had nine that have been taken. Uh, they're $5,000 a piece. That has helped tremendously in the support of raising the money for the barn. And Carroll County has many families with very deep roots here in the county. And I would anticipate with uh, only 21 leaves remaining that we would fill up uh, this uh, memory tree and um, uh, in recognition or in memory of various families. located at the Carroll County Farm Museum and Fall Harvest Day, October the 2nd, with a, a um, ribbon cutting ceremony at 1130. So any of you that wanna come to the ribbon cutting, we'll mark that down on your calendar. That concludes my slides. And I'll make a few other comments and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions. Um, Excuse me, Bob. Yes. Uh, talk about the, um, the guide that we would like to have. I'm coming. Learn. I'm yeah. coming to that. Okay, and then that's, that's what I want to pass around the sign-up yeah. I asked the question, are we finished yet? No. In fact, the educational committee work is just beginning. And that's what Charlene preempted me on. Uh, and so I said, well, how can people help? And one of the things that we are going to need and we're going to have training for it is guides. This winter, we expect to have some guide training. We'd like to have 25 or 30 guides uh, in that training class uh, because uh, except on busy weekends and for school children, and by the way, the educational program is geared to the third, fourth, and fifth grade curriculum of the Maryland, uh, state of Maryland curriculum for the colonial period. Now, most of us have probably had some experience in a farm setting, but I dare say that most of our children have not had any farm experience. They don't understand how the work, the system worked to produce food and fiber, and particularly during the colonial period. And so it's gonna be essential that we have guides that are gonna be available for volunteering uh, on weekends, special weekends, uh, as well as for uh, the some 15,000 school kids that we expect to visit this barn on an uh, annual basis. School uh, teachers are always looking for something that fits into the curriculum as far as a, a uh, field trip is concerned. So sign up, uh, you'll enjoy it, and you've already got some of the information that uh, you'll need to be a guide, but it's not difficult. If I can remember to do it, so can you. Um, we just signed an agreement with the uh, Community Foundation of Carroll County. Uh, if we have any money left over, I doubt that we do. But if we do have any money left over, we're going to put it into the community foundation. And we put 
uh, brochures around at the table. Uh, that's meant for one to a family, and if any of you, we probably didn't have enough to go around. Is anybody, any family that doesn't have a brochure yet, or would you share if you uh, got two to your family? Um, um, the Community Foundation, of course, is a 501c3 organization, so the money will be tax exempt. Uh, as I already mentioned, on the, on the donation board, uh, those con contributions to be on the board is a $500 minimum, uh, the memory tree, and then we just established a sustaining membership. And all those funds will be going to the Community Foundation specifically for ongoing uh, uh, educational and maintenance program. Uh, we'll have annual maintenance that has to be done to this barn. Uh, it sits uh, on soil, a favorite place for termites to get in. We don't want the termites to take over, so we'll have to treat that. We will, as soon as, sometime this fall, we'll be treating it with, for termites the first time, and then we'll be doing annual inspections and other maintenance work. Uh, the sustaining membership is $35 per person, per family, for a, uh, um, annual membership and a one-time life membership for the sustaining member is $250. We want to try to have at least twenty-five dollars or $30,000 in that fund uh, to begin with in order to provide for maintenance and uh, educational programs. Uh, this pretty well concludes my uh, uh, presentation. I want to have questions. But I can tell you uh, at this point that uh, this has been a wonderful but sometimes tedious journey over this five-year period. It's been well worth it because here we're going to give a chance to preserve for future generations uh, the skill and the hardships and the uh, craftsmanship that our forefathers uh, have so well demonstrated in this barn. So thank you very much. I'll be willing to entertain questions uh, that you might have. And so, yes. They did not take part in the building because because we were, it was important for us to do contracting. Uh, they do not do things on contract. Uh, they do it on uh, uh, time and material. And uh, uh, probably if I as an individual had had that barn and I wanted to build it, I would have probably said time, time and material uh, because they do outstanding work but we were not able to use them. Yes, Timmy. Uh, could I ask you, Bob, to repeat the question? Oh, yeah, sure. The question was, how was the Amish involved in the work of the barn? They were not. Other questions? Bob? Yes. Hi, my name is Sam Brainerd. I had the pleasure of uh, being uh, slightly involved with the barn from its beginning movement to the Farm Museum. I was on the Board of Governors of the Farm Museum back then, and now I'm on the Publications Committee. And uh, so I hesitate to ask this question, but I'm a historian, so I'm all about dates. Uh, can you uh, tell me why you're estimating the date of the barn at about 1794? Well, uh, yes. Uh, the date of the barn, uh, we had a consultant uh, that was an expert in log buildings and particularly log barns uh, to uh, meet with us at the very beginning uh, that went uh, through the barn and uh, he used such things as nails 
the kind of nails that were in there, uh, uh, the uh, saw marks, circular saws were not in effect. The old steam up and down saws were uh, in uh, before 1800. Uh, and uh, he had a flashlight on a pretty day that he visited us and I wondered why in the world he had a flashlight. And he went over and he shined the flashlight on the, on the logs and he says, this, this was done by a right-handed person doing the hewing. And this over here was done by a left-handed person that did the hewing. He pointed out all kinds of marks that I uh, uh, probably don't remember very well, but uh, it uh, also, the Maryland Historic Trust had also done a study on the barn some five years before, and they put it in that time period also. So since I wasn't a, I'm not used Greenwood. Since I wasn't there at the time, I can't argue with them. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any chance of using tree ring data? To well, the tree ring data goes back about 500 years because these logs were uh, uh, built, uh, were started. They had rings that were about 250 years old. Well, they would have been cut just before the barn was built. So if the barn is 216 years old or so, uh, then uh, you add that on to 250-year-old logs, those trees started to grow about uh, 500 years ago. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Yes, Jim. Did they build those buildings out of green lumber, or did they let it cure a little bit first? The, the question was, was it built out of green level uh, lumber or did they let it mature some? I suspect by the time they got those, first of all, they probably cut the trees in the wintertime. And the trees in the wintertime, of course, the sap's down in the roots. Uh, that's the best time to cut firewood, for instance, because then you're not having to dry out the, uh, the wood. But I suspect by the time they got all the trees cut and hewed, that uh, uh, they had some drying time. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in, in notching those logs, the hewing and the notching was much easier to do with green wood than it is with old hard oak wood. Uh, so that was probably done earlier. And to tell you the truth, when you have uh, 90 logs, those bottom logs times um, probably a ton and a half, average ton and a half per log. There was a lot of weight on them and that probably also helped them fit better uh, in the notching. So I would say they probably had some time to dry, but uh, if they started in the winter time to do the logs, I suspect they built the barn that summer, yes. Okay, well, I'm not a historian, so I, I, I don't dispute that at all. The only thing I do know is the, uh, the person that is director of the elementary educational program for the Maryland Agricultural Education Foundation, she happens to live here in the county, and she matched it up with the curriculum people in the Maryland Department of Ed Education. So they called it the colonial period and maybe that was loosely used, I'm not sure. Yes, somebody else over here. Yes. Get Richard to explain that to you. <laughs> now, the 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 uh, king, the king method, as I understood, had one means of support that went up and supported the ridge pole, but this one had two, 
and the rafters rested on and came up here to a point, and they had no support up there at the point. That was the reason that they were mortised and tendoned together. And, uh, uh, and you know how I learned that? I asked Richard before the meeting. <laughs> okay, time for one more question, then we're going to stop. Yes. The question was that the the outside uh, boarding of the barn looks very natural. That's because it is very natural. We may put a a uh, material on the outside, I think our plans are, that will help to preserve it some, but those boards are going to naturally turn gray. And, uh, uh, and we've all seen lots of old gray barns. Look at any old wood. Uh, over time, it's going to turn gray, and that's the barn is already making its, uh, its turn towards that gray color. Well, let me say you've been a wonderful audience and I've enjoyed uh, making this presentation today. <laughs>